Very, very good morning, dear listeners. Welcome to this devotional time where we wait to see God, His presence, and His Word in the lives of each one of us. Welcome to this space called Mana, source of blessing and spiritual health for all those who join us. Why, if God does not need anything from us, does He want us to give? This is a very interesting question I would like to answer and develop with you today. Very good morning. I am Pastor Carlos Rios. This is our devotional Mana, a daily adventure with God. There is a decision because we're talking about decisions. When life each day gives us choices, we must be prepared because our decisions are what will make the difference if we advance and progress or if we remain stagnant. There's a decision for this year, 2023, that I would like for you to think about. What is the condition of your heart? Is your heart generous, willing, with a helping spirit? Or is your heart closed, a heart that is not willing to give? Think about it this morning and allow God, through His Word, today, to speak through each one of the verses He has for us. Let's go to Scripture, because I believe that it is important for God's Word to affirm in this point, these points. It is true that God does not need anything from us, as it says in Psalm 50, 12. I love this psalm that says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. And so if God does not need our money, why does he want us to give? Because God did establish a method for the extension of his kingdom. And this method is established in his word through tithes and offerings. So let's look in the light of the Bible. Some examples in the Old and the New Testament. Let's begin with the famous tabernacle in the times of Moses. This tabernacle was designed by God. God was specific with the materials and absolutely everything regarding how it should be constructed. But something special happened. It says in Genesis chapter 36 verses 2 through 6. Exodus 36, 2 through 6. Then Moses summoned Bazalel and Ohaliab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all of the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Here, the people not only gave and contributed, but with their work they went and got involved with their gifts, talents, abilities. And so look at this beautiful story. It says that the moment the time came when Moses had to tell the people, do not bring any more. Another similar example is in the case of the temple. The temple was built by Solomon, but truly who prepared, who designed, who did all the work and put in all the effort was King David. And it caused my attention powerfully when I read the text in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 3. David says, Besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. Everything began by David himself, who encouraged everyone. In this temple, as we say, was done without skimping, with all the best materials. It was completely spectacular. As the people themselves said, but everything began 
by the king. It says that from his personal treasure, he contributed and he himself made sure that the people would bring and give to build this beautiful temple. And so look at, look at how God wants people to give for his work. God does not need anything from us, but his work should be sanctified. And so if we continue with the Old Testament, how did the priests, the Levites, and those who offered service, they did it in the same way. It was from the voluntary exercise of giving from the people by the people who gave, who contributed for the work. This is what scripture says. Look at what Numbers says in chapter 18. Numbers 18 verses 1 to 3 says, Numbers 18 verses 20 through 21. The Lord said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share in your inheritance among the Israelites. I give to you to I give the to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. This was the reason why God established a tribe exclusively to serve God, to serve the temple, the service. And of course, since all the other tribes had land to cultivate, God said to this tribe, you will not have land. You will be dedicated exclusively to the service, to the work, and all the other 11 tribes will set aside the tithe and bring it to you. This had logic. It made sense. How interesting. And so look at how in the Old Testament, God designs giving, but not because God needs, but because this was the method he himself established for his kingdom to be established. Let's talk about the New Testament. For example, let's begin by Jesus. With Jesus in Luke chapter 8 talks to us about how the ministry of Jesus was sustained. Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3. After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Johanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Harad's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. How beautiful. Women who, after having experienced blessing, the gift of seeing Jesus blessing their lives, they, with their resources, blessed the ministry. Look, they sustained Jesus and his disciples. Of course, because Jesus and his disciples were working 100% of the time on the work of the ministry. And so it makes sense that these women were concerned and said, let's sustain this work and we're going to help for it to be carried out. Let's talk about the first church. In the same way, the first church talks to us about how the first church was born in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. And for example, there is a detail that calls my attention powerfully in the book of Acts. It says that in the time of the apostles, in Acts 4, verse 33, it says, With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And so imagine that in the time of the first church, a church with so much strength was formed that the Bible says that absolutely everything was at the service for one another for the extension of the kingdom so that the name of the Lord would be known. Now, allow me to tell you that the Apostle Paul left us great teachings in regards to the ministry. 
and in regards to giving, for example, Paul was clear in this principle of supporting God's work. Paul uses an expression that you know very well in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. God does not need money. You are completely correct. But God wants that when the work begins to be developed for the kingdom to be extended, that there be resources so that the servants, the workers, those who preach day and night, those who go from one place to another, have what they need to fulfill the task. Now, if there are people fulfilling their tasks, their obligations, living in good conditions, why cannot God's servants also live well, living in optimal conditions so that they are able to have the strength, the grace, the wisdom, the power to announce God King, God's kingdom everywhere they go. When speaking about this, the Apostle Paul, when discussing our attitude in regards to giving, because here the problem is not giving or not to give, the problem is the attitude, as we have been discussing during these days, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so do not have the wrong motivations. And when I wrap up this topic, shortly I will let you know what the conclusion is of why God wants us to give, even though he does not need anything from us. Attitude is very important. I would say that in giving, it is everything. Paul says, for no reason, give reluctantly. We do not give because it makes business sense or because God will multiply and prosper us and everything will go well for us. We give with an attitude of thankfulness, of honor, of praise, giving thanks to God for his favors and his mercies. The Apostle Paul finishes with a great dissertation that I love where in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Apostle Paul ends with saying, telling us what the attitude in the hearts of a child of God should be. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2, now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatians churches to do. Verse 2. Now, notice that here Paul gives us four principles. First, he says, on the first day of every week. Paul here is talking to us about something called per periodically. And the issue is that sometimes people give in church, but it's just every once in a while. But the fact is that the Lord's churches have to meet obligations just as any other business or corporation. There are services and obligations that need to be paid to others. This is why a church should have a budget. This is why we should give to God's work, to God's church, consistently, timely, periodically, so that God's work can be sustained. And so we'll hear where Paul says every first day of the week, he is talking about a period. Then he says, each one of you, Paul is talking to everyone. Paul's not saying some have to or some should and the others do not. Paul is saying that every one of us should participate in this beautiful task. The third point, it says, each one of you should set aside a sum. And so do you see, no one should say that they have nothing to give because God always gives us. And then it says, in keeping with your income. And so do you see here lies the point in the measure that God blesses and prospers the work of your hands. And to, do not be confused saying, well, pastor, tithing is only in the Old Testament. No, tithing was a base that was practiced in the Old Testament. Today, God wants us to give even more because his work must be extended and multiplied. And so to wrap up, our discussion today, my dear family, I want to end 
just as I began. The conclusion is clear in regards to giving or not giving, because this is a year of decisions and I want you to decide in your heart, will you give or not? So let me give you some information. If you do not give, do not worry about it. God will continue to help you to listen to your prayers. He will continue to love you. If you do not give, do not worry. You will not be condemned. If you do not give, do not worry. The church will continue because God will always find the way to sustain his work and his children. But I do have to share with you a sad notice, sad news in regards to this point. If you do not give, you are missing out on the blessing of participating in the work and the extension of God's kingdom because God wants it to be with you, through you, and by the resources he gives you. And so I'll wrap up by saying, why, if God does not need anything from us, why does he want us to give? And it's very simple. God wants us to give, firstly, to free us from selfishness. I love when the Bible says, do not close your hand to your neighbor. I love it in, when in the Old Testament, in the law of giving, God orders the people, when you go to harvest, do not pick up what falls to the ground, because what falls to the ground is for the poor who will come to pick up what is on the ground. Wow, God is always thinking about everyone. And this is why I say God wants us to give because he wants us to be free from selfishness. Because when we give, we are free from selfishness. And another beautiful thing is God gives us for us to give, not so that we are filled with selfishness and greed. God blesses us for us to bless. God gives us so that we bless others. And so the question today is, do you want to give or do you not want to give? But all of this has to do with the extension of his kingdom. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for your church. Thank you for all these people that listen to this message today. Only you can place in their hearts to participate in the extension of the kingdom and that with what you give them, be it little or much, we can contribute for God's kingdom to continue extending in God's word continue extending to the ends of the earth, reaching many lives, many marriages, hearts, people who are in need around the world. Raise ministries and raise churches each day. Raise pastors all around the world so that each day we go to fulfill this task in the Lord's name be known. Thank you, because just as in the time of Moses, you will raise up men and women who are generous willing in their hearts that not only want to give but also to turn over their lives to participate in this beautiful work we commend ourselves to you we ask for your blessing and we thank you for going in front of us caring for us guarding us and sustaining us we praise and bless you in the name of christ jesus amen and amen blessings to all was daily. It was collected very early in the morning. Each one collected according to their need and was collected by families. Very, very good morning. Welcome to this devotional time where we get up to seek God's presence and his word in the lives of each and every one of us. Manna, the daily spiritual food that cannot be missing in our lives, led by Carlos Rios in the voice of John Vidal.